Okay, so thank you to all of you for hanging there until the last panel. That, of course, will be the most interesting one, goes without <laughs> saying. Uh, we have with us great speakers. We also have two speakers online that I would like to see in the video. Yes, you can see Rachel. And we also have another speaker, Shippe. Yes. So now we are complete. Amazing. Also gender balance panel, just saying that. Um, so let's start without further ado because we only have one hour. So before starting with our discussion, maybe some um, in-house rules. We don't have a lot of time. So I think I will give five minutes to each of the speakers to reply to one question and elaborate a little bit. And then we will try to leave at least uh, 15, 20 minutes at the end for a Q&A or for additional round of discussion, if time allows. So our session today will discuss something that I think, can you hear me, right? That I think it's very important because very often we discuss about just transition and we give for granted that at local level, everybody knows what it is about. But it's actually a very complex um, definition and there is even not a universally accepted definition. I'm sure the EBRD has one, the World Bank has definitely one. Uh, there are many different definitions that are circulating out there, but what is not um, clear I think is what local communities, especially in those regions that are highly reliant on coal, know and think about the just transition. And using this kind of context, uh, the World Bank, uh, I think was back last year that the idea was launched and then materialized in October, together with the energy community, we launched a just transition public perception survey uh, really to, to understand what is the level of awareness, what are the perceptions, what are the concerns, um, and what are the fears really of communities that are facing this just transition. It sounds very good for us, but terrifying when you are in one of the coal regions. Um, and this will be the, the light motif of our session. We have an amazing um, uh, lineup of speakers with us. I will uh, briefly introduce all of them, and then I will give the floor immediately to our first speaker. So we have with us um, Rachel Perks, Senior Mining Specialist from the World Bank. She's joining us all the way from Washington, DC. Many thanks, Rachel. We have with us here in the room, Ioana Chuta, Energy Coordinator from Bankwatch. Thank you for coming. We also have Sir John Kukoli, Health and Energy Advisor for the Balkan region from EEL. I have close to me Anna Vasilyeva, Associate Climate Strategy and Delivery from the EBRD, all the way from London. Thank you for coming. Online, we also have Shipi Naziri Vela. She's the founder of Women in Energy and Mining, and she's connected from Kosovo. Thank you, Shipe. And last but not least, we have with us Goran Kerstovic. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Senior Professional GIZ Program for Decarbonization, who is local from Sarajevo. Thank you so much. And without further ado, I will give the floor to our first speaker, Rachel. I would like to also have the PowerPoint presentations shared. And I think the best, uh, Rachel, will be that you just say next, uh, and then our, yes, um, that you just say next, uh, and then they can change the slides. So on this, over to you, Rachel, thank you. Okay, great. Arena, confirming you can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay, great, great. Well, well, first off, I'm so sorry that I can't be with you. I was just in Sarajevo and, and all throughout Bosnia-Herzegovina a few weeks ago, and we had hoped the forum would coincide around that time so that I could be present uh, in person. But anyways, it's still a great pleasure to be able to be with all of you today and to speak as Arena has so well introduced on a very important subject that is perhaps not so adequately covered in a lot of the discussions around the energy transition. And that's really why um, we joined hands with the Energy Community Secretariat last year to launch this public perception survey on understandings around just transition because as part of the bank's corporate priorities, we have a strong emphasis on citizen engagement. And certainly 
certainly in these types of processes of development where we have major structural changes occurring in communities, uh, it's very important that we have a strong understanding of what different stakeholders view as priorities, opportunities, but also hindrances and constraints to uh, the energy transition so that in the work that we do, we are very responsive, respectful, and cognizant of um, the need to be engaging with communities in the ways that they feel is most appropriate. So with that in mind, I would ask that we move on um, to the slide. Thank you. Yeah, just very briefly, um, the World Bank adopted a new framework for a just transition for all in 2019. And as some of you know, uh, this was really based on our um, forensic analysis of over $3 billion worth of lending we had done on coal sector transition back in the 1990s and the early 2000s. And one of the chief lessons that really informed this new framework going forward was the need for more inclusive stakeholder engagement. And although you see it sitting in the pillar we have on institutional governance, it really is a uh, important component of all our work, depending on what phase of transition we are in. Now, in the majority of cases, as we know, globally, a lot of countries are still planning and preparing. We are looking towards targets for closures, you know, as early as 2025 in some countries for thermal power plants and mines, but really everyone is working towards the 2050 targets, which means that we're doing a lot of planning at the moment, assisting governments and communities in how to strategize these transitions and therefore the element of inclusive stakeholder engagement is really critical. But it also extends, you know, the minute that plants and, and mines start to close, as well as into the whole process of regional transition, which is really this third phase where we are now into active sort of regeneration and transformation of regions. Next slide, please. As Arena already introduced, um, we joined forces last year to launch a public perception survey on the subject of just transition in the Western Balkans. Now we focused on the five coal producing countries. So that means we left Albania out for reasons of just lack of you know, coal production. Thanks to uh, the Energy Community Secretariat, we had a very strong involvement of civil society organizations, both in the testing of the instrument when we did original sort of rollout and also in the dissemination of the instrument when it went live, as well as in discussions there were several um, qualitative surveys that were also done by phone to deepen some of our knowledge and on key subjects. So really thankful for all the civil society organizations that participated. And I believe as a result of that partnership, we were really able to reach a lot more communities than we had anticipated. Next slide, please. This is just giving you a sense of the methodology of the survey. Um, I'm very proud to say that this is the first survey that's ever been done of its kind in the region and a very, very large um, sample size, as you can see. And we also had a very strong sample on the control group so that we could understand really perceptions amongst coal communities versus perceptions amongst non-coal communities to understand whether there were really significant differences and we're gonna go through some of that. And this just gives you a sense of all of the communities, the coal regions that participated and the number of individuals per region that participated in the quantitative survey. And then in addition, we had qualitative surveys that were rolled out as you see here. Next slide, please. So we, we took a lot of time to try to build um, the survey in a way so that we could try to tackle some key um, themes, I would say. And as you can see here on the screen, we really focused, we wanted to have an understanding of people's knowledge and awareness on just transition. We also wanted to have 
an understanding of perceptions, which are very different, obviously, from knowledge and awareness. So the first is really trying to understand what, from a policy perspective, governments and um, local CSOs can do to increase knowledge and awareness. The second is perceptions, which really gets at people's opinions of you know, whether it's challenges or opportunities so that we can better target initiatives and activities going forward. The third element of the survey was looking at conditions and expectations. So really what would be some of the things that um, community members felt must happen in order for a just transition to be achieved along with how they see the outcome. So meaning the expectations around what a just transition will eventually look like. And then of course, deepening our, our knowledge of how to engage more strategically and effectively with citizens and around um, more broadly, I would say stakeholder consultations in the whole closure planning and eventual implementation. Next slide, please. So what I'd like to do now now is to go through some of the key headlines and findings. The first is around this category of awareness. And I would say that overall, there's a very limited awareness um, across all of the Western Balkan countries that were surveyed on the concept of just transition. Um, quite a high number, I mean, 80% is quite a high number of respondents that uh, answered that they are not familiar with the just transition concept. And what that should be prompting us as either policymakers or multilateral development institutions or partner development partner organizations is to really think much more strategically about how we can support government and non-government actors in these coal producing countries and their regions in particular to, to gain a better understanding of these very complex concepts as Arena already pointed out. What is also striking about the survey is that 69% of all the respondents reported that they're not familiar with the efforts of the Western Balkans when it comes to issues to do with energy transition. Again, this is more of a communications aspect in, in our view where governments and non-government actors um, could be uh, more strategically communicating the efforts that they are making, because as we know, and we've been hearing today, there are significant efforts. And to think about ways to reach community actors that perhaps are not um, being targeted in the types of community communication campaigns that governments and non-government actors are making. And we'll get to that in a moment in terms of the mechanisms. Next slide, please. Around the, the second heading, which was around perceptions and expectations, um, I mean, it's not surprising that uh, just under 50% of respondents in coal regions do expect negative consequences. And much like many of the other parts of the world where we are working and many other partner organizations are probably working, job losses right and, right, and linked to that rising unemployment is the top concern followed by the increase in electricity and heating prices. Of course, we have to be very aware that again, we were um, targeting the samples in the coal regions themselves. And so the issues that they feel are very much at their hearts are these issues of job loss, unemployment, and of course, um, the price of heating and electricity. Now on the positive side, it was, it was interesting to note that 33% of respondents believe that you know the improvement of local environmental conditions is the most important outcome and i can say that you know from even the few weeks that i was traveling around bosnia herzegovina in every mine site and thermal power plant area that we visited both municipalities regional governments local community groups mine unions all cited the need to really focus now on reclamation, remediation of lands, and the management of a lot of environmental legacies that have been left, you know, over the last few decades. And so I think this is a very poignant result that speaks to the need for our just transition work to have a much stronger integration of the environmental concerns in it. 
And of course, linked to that is, is obviously the um, connection the communities feel to the global targets around um, environmental improvements. Next slide, please. The third headline that we um, wanted to look at was the question of citizen engagement. And um, not surprising, but certainly um, very hopeful for, for us was to see that 73% of respondents in all the countries believe that citizens should be involved in the energy transition process. Um, what I found also particularly heartening from the work that we have been doing in many countries is that 67% of those in the coal regions think that there should be specific bodies organized in communities that can be um, both the catalyst and the owner in a way of these citizen engagement processes. And certainly for those of you who um, have sort of listened to us talk about governance, um, this is a chief area that we have been promoting from the beginning is the need for very hybrid governance solutions in countries where planning and preparing for the closure of thermal power plants and mines has a very specific engagement node sitting at the community level. And so nice to see that as, as institutions were very much aligned with community thinking on that. Now, just under half of respondents, um, interestingly, expect that the just transition is going to succeed and that in order for it to succeed, it's going to need a lot of financial support and also political pressure in the Western Balkans region. You know, citizens see that pressure coming from the European Union. We just had Stefano speaking a bit about legislation, but also from the energy community, which of course is one of the doyens of a lot of the, the legislation that governs energy transition in the region. What I found particularly um, poignant in terms of mediums of communication and ways to improve outreach to coal communities is the use of television and expert discussions on TV. And I'd say this is something that sort of sets the region apart in my view, compared to other places in the world where we're working, where radio is seen as a more effective means of communication, community forum groups. Here in this region, it's really about bringing uh, expertise to sort of debate and to discuss issues in a televised manner to um, community members. Next slide, please. Now, one of the last, um, <clears throat> when we think about sort of the key messages for moving forward, um, we've been, we, as I said, we've been um, doing a lot of work around governance structures for transition and trying to make the links between high level planning bodies, which have to be in place in any country in order for policy and legislative decisions and major budget decisions to be made on transition, trying to create the link between the need for these high level bodies with instruments and platforms, structures at the community level that really bring the groundswell of ideas, you know, from the coal regions themselves into that planning process at the national or the, the, the higher state level. So, in this sense, one of the key messages that we believe would be to develop these common frameworks, um, both in the coal regions and perhaps across coal regions in the entire Western Balkans region, where a framework and an approach could be developed that really articulates what a just transition means for countries in the Western Balkans region. And to have a very clear articulation of that now, of course, the, the World Bank, as I showed you, has its own framework, but every country is going to adopt perhaps its own framework of understanding of just transition. But going back to that issue of knowledge and awareness, very high deficit, which really um, leads to perhaps um, the need for government and, and non-government actors to work together to better articulate what it is that a just transition is going to mean in the Western Balkans countries 
and how it is going to happen and over what time periods. These are a lot of the pieces of information that I think citizens are looking for, particularly those that are um, actively working in mines and thermal power plants or for those who are dependent economically on the coal producing economy for their livelihoods. Now, um, as I said, with our work on governance, we're strong believers in regional platforms, mechanisms, ways for governments to formally engage with citizens at the coal region. And this is obviously a key message that emerges out of these um, findings from the survey. And really, um, as we've been talking about, to be very targeted to specific groups. So we know that men and women are going to fare very differently in general when it comes to energy transition. There's going to be significant job losses for men. There's going to be less job losses, obviously, for women just due to um, the rates of participation in the coal producing economy. But at the same time, we know from other types of mine closures that often when there's high rates of joblessness in, in male predominant sectors. This can lead to significant pressures on women to increase income in households. It also um, has a tendency to lead to higher rates of domestic violence, alcoholism, drug abuse, because of just the effects of joblessness. So we wanna curb a lot of these things, obviously, when it comes to coal sector transition. And part of that has to be to work very explicitly with specific target groups and to think about their very specific needs and how we can be addressing them through policy and implementation actions. Um, everywhere that we're working, we see the need to engage the youth. Why? Because often these are the future of coal regions. If we want to help to retain talent in coal regions, we have to be engaging very explicitly with an understanding of what it's going to take to keep youth in their regions, whether in terms of uh, ed tertiary education opportunities that are going to lead to new types of jobs, whether it is in the types of jobs that the youth are going to be looking to be involved in, and the way that they see their coal regions transforming in the future. And so a lot of the strategy development and engagement exercises in this pre-planning sort of planning process towards an, an effective coal sector transition really need to engage with the youth at all levels to ensure that their voices are heard and not only heard, but that their, their ideas are influencing directly policy. And we've seen this to be a very important strategy in a number of the countries where we're currently working. And of course, you know, as, as um, multilateral development institutions, you know, we have EBRD with us on this panel today, or whether as um, other types of partners such as GIZ that's here on the panel today, it is really incumbent upon us to advocate and to do the work necessary to raise the financing and the um, public and private sources of capital that are going to be required for these transitions. These transitions are going to be multi-generational, complex, very heavy lifting programs required. Public finances will not be able to meet all of the demands that are going to arise. There's a need for public-private partnerships on very large, transformative, innovative scales. And I believe it's very incumbent upon us as the international finance community to do our bid to ensure that we are advocating for and raising as much of the global you know, climate financing as we can to come to bear on the complex transitions in this region. Next slide, please. And with that, I thank you for your time. I hope I didn't um, go too over. And again, my sincere apologies. I could not be with you today, Irina. Uh, I really wanna thank you. And I wanna thank my colleague, Justine, who I believe is online today, for having really been wonderful stewards of this entire process. And it was such a pleasure to be able to work so closely with the Energy Community Secretariat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, it was a pleasure to work with you and Justine as well. And thank you also for framing our discussion. So 
so well. And I think there is a lot of work for all of us, for IFIs, for sure, for international organizations, civil society, donors. So a bit for all of us to raise awareness, which is really alarming, this 80%. Um, let me go to our second speaker, Joanna. We heard from Rachel the, the, the topic of the, one of the main concerns being really the financial support. And that, of course, we cannot depend only on public finance, but we need more, we need more structure. Uh, what do you think a just transition fund will be critical and how can this push forward in the region? Yeah, thank you very much. And indeed, it was one of the one of the main conclusions in the in the survey was was this financial support and, and political pressure from the EU that it's, it could be one of the key drivers to for the transition. But also I noticed in the morning in one of the first interventions the there was you know an ask for eu funding for for the transition and and personally when i i mean i didn't get to visit the region very much lately for obvious reasons but i did do a, a rather big tour and um and and at the beginning of at the end of last year and you know communities and and mayors that i was meeting with um in in both bosnia and herzegovina and montenegro um they were expressing the need for a dedicated uh, just transition fund, which is something that we in Bankwatch have um, have advocated for um, and we, we think would be beneficial. And yeah, I think pretty much all the all the organizations, the civil society organizations that are working on the topic would uh, would support that. And this is it's driven on the one hand, you know, the, this immediate need for a, for a just transition fund. It's driven on the one hand by the political commitments, right? Like the the carbon neutrality by 2050 commitment, um, equally as in the EU, um, will will force the the region to um, to shift the economy and um, away from from fossil fuels to to clean energy, um, and it will be even a bit more difficult for the region than, than in the EU, right? Because the, the starting point, the, the coal dependence or the fossil fuel dependency um, is higher here than, than in the EU, than most EU countries. But on the other hand, we feel that this, this need for a dedicated fund is also driven by the, the urgency that we've seen, we've, yeah, we've seen an, appetizer if you want to call it of the of the crisis last winter when when coal power plants started collapsing and it, it is as, as it is i think some of the some of the coal power plants will have to close um sooner than than they were anticipated by any of the um people responsible in the in the governments or in the management of the of the companies so the reality is coming sooner than than expected um and yeah i mean rachel mentioned earlier the the work of of the world bank in some of the countries in late 90s early 2000s i i was a first year student in journalism writing about the the coal closures in romania in the late 90s and yeah it's not something that i would like to to see repeated so i think I think financial institutions have, have come a long way since then, but I think this element of um, inclusiveness and kind of take social dialogue is, um, is still needed in the allocation of, of funds and so on. Um, also in the, when we're speaking about what's driving what's driving this this fund um the economic reality we've just seen the regulation on carbon border adjustment mechanism right it, it passed it's going to come coal electricity will be more expensive and it will also force uh some closures so um yeah this um this kind of brings us to the to the idea that or, or to the to the things that I've heard from from the local level that yeah yeah there is funding available we've heard from from Syria from several donors different international financial institutions um, EU funds um, so I think 
I think people on the decision makers uh, on the local level are relatively confused about what's available and when and how much. And what I've heard very often is that the the municipalities that would have to apply for some of this funding, they, they lack the knowledge, like technical abilities to write these proposals and, and do fundraising for so, something like that. So the the sources are are quite yeah they're they're known for example the the economic and investment plan for the for the western balkans that was mentioned earlier that is known but out of the 10 priorities like the 10 flagship um priorities that we've seen there is no earmarking specifically for just transition so and and the the first list of projects that we've seen that were proposed by the countries um no such measures yet even though there is a recognition that this is this is urgent right and that the planning should start much earlier um and then in terms of what else is available of course there are the loans from the world bank from the ebrd from the eib and other epa funds um but even to us you know having bank in the name and following the money it's it's quite unclear what the size of the funding is and what kind of projects um, this this funding would would cover, and then there's also the the potential sources of fine funding like revenues from from carbon border adjustment mechanism or um, if the countries do implement a carbon pricing uh, system before that, it will take a while and the need is is here. Um, yeah, we were even thinking maybe in, in discussions with with some of the some of the municipalities and among ourselves maybe having the energy community secretariat kind of um see over a, a fund for the region would make sense because yeah this was the the driver for the decarbonization in the region in the first place so yeah when we're talking about why is it why do we feel that it's it's needed to have a dedicated fund? Um, basically, because it would have clear governance, a clear governance structure, and and accountability and and transparency of what's available and when, and it would um, it would make things a bit more predictable for the for the regions that would access these funds. And then we also feel that they would create equal opportunities for for the regions to apply for funding, like. like yeah, they would just need to to figure out one mechanism how to how to get to to the money, rather than um, rules from from different sources. And I think it's also very important that it, it would single to it would signal to to national and and regional decision makers that just transition funding is a priority, right? Because now, yeah, on <laughs> on the declaration level, it is a priority, but and when we're looking at the allocation, it, it is not so. And I think by by having this this fund uh, dedicated, um, it it really encourages kind of constructive competitiveness between the regions and and cooperation and so on. So yeah, I will I will conclude with some of the and I think they've they've been circulated before, but um, I can never. Uh, repeat them enough, the, the principles of funding the, the transition that um, we and several uh, civil society organizations in the region are, are working on um, have, have endorsed. Um, the, the funding should be, should be based on participatory and, and transparent um, local development plans created bottom-up um, projects supported should have a region must have a regional positive impact within the coal regions and they would um, they must exclude support of any kind to to fossil fuels and most importantly um, the allocation of funds to coal region must be fair um, in other words it should reflect the ma magnitude of the transition and kind of reward the the speed of transition and on that note i will just say that with um, together with the green tank in Greece, we did um, we did a modeling um, on how a fair allocation of 
um, of the fund should look in the region, kind of like learning from the mistakes that were done in the EU with the Just Transition Fund. Um, so one of the main conclusions uh, is indeed that the, the sooner a country plans for, for the, or, or will exit uh, coal, the, the bigger the share of the funding. Um, so yeah, if um, for those interested, um, that is available on somewhere there on the internet under just transition fund allocation criteria. And we did include Albania also in the modeling, uh, even though it doesn't have uh, coal regions, it has oil. So yeah, it is a bit of a challenge there too. Thank you very much, Joanna. So, I mean, we understand that just transition should be a priority and should have a very clear governance structure. And even if there are some funding already allocated, the question is more about earmarking just transition correctly, but also supporting the contracting parties when it comes to applying, because it's not easy. So maybe simplify the process would also be beneficial for sure. Um, thank you again, and we will make sure to circulate the, the study, which is very interesting with all the participants today. I'm going to the next speaker, uh, looking at him, Surgeon. Uh, so we, we heard from Rachel that 33% of respondents, uh, they think that actually local environment will benefit greatly from a just transition. I think it's positive. And this is very much linked, I think, also with air quality, because people that are living in cold regions, they the experience first hands the negative spillover effect of you know all the, the bad air quality. So what do you think will be um, critical uh, as a kind of short term actions to, to improve this? And what do you think about the numbers and results that you see in the survey? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your question. There isn't uh, like um, an emergence uh, reaction, I would say, or action that should be taken because this is something that we are facing for decades. So the air pollution is like affecting the human health across the region and the world, of course, but we're speaking about the Western Balkan six countries. And those like our parents being exposed to the air pollution for a very long period of time. We are experiencing the same, I guess the children and the new gener generation will, will face the same, which is like a huge um, uh, threat for the human health. And um, I think that many of the citizens are um, aware of the negative effects of air pollution on the human health, but I'm, I'm not sure that they really do understand how it also affects the communities and the future uh, as itself. And um, one of the problems that we are also seeing is that the countries are not running any kind of public campaigns uh, about the air pollution and, and the health, of course, because they've been responsible for putting all of this pollution out. And uh, but but the countries and the leaders are one hundred percent responsible why we are facing and going through all of this. I'm not gonna say any you know other way. Um, the Hill is um, one of the NGOs uh, and partnering with the others in publishing those reports and showing the numbers. Actually, we understood at the beginning that we are actually want to um, explain how the air pollution go uh, with it helped. But then we understood that decision makers and policy makers are speaking about the numbers and the money. So we understand that, that the energy is about the business, it's not about human I and mean, human health. So, and unfortunately, I'm listening to lots of people sitting here today and speaking about you know the facilities and buildings and the transition, but we are not like really explaining how the transition is affecting or delaying the transition is affecting the, the future of these communities. So he is also explaining and showing the numbers and, and telling the countries by delaying all of this transition and coal phase out, the, the, there's a huge amount of health costs. And people are questioning what is the health cost is actually not just speaking about, because they, they usually um, connect the health cost with, with the premature deaths and the non-communicable diseases, but it's like really visiting your doctor because you have to pay for that, the treatments, um, staying at, a, at the hospital. So there is a lot of different kind of, of the costs behind the scene. And I think that we need to speak about this. I have to say that I was really surprised to see the Minister of, of um, Energy Serbia mentioning, and uh, also the another representative of the, of the ministry, mentioning that the air pollution is affecting the health. She also mentioned that just two or three uh, weeks ago, which is like a huge surprise for us. Um, maybe the people in the room and also listening to, to this panel online, uh, maybe do not understand well how um, it's hard to put health at the energy and environment agenda. Our job is also to do the legal analysis of all um, available um, 
legal papers like a strategy is low by laws decision and to see where the health is, um, uh, is it present or not in those documents. And I have to say that unfortunately, you know, it's not, um, there is no health at all. So our job is to send the message to the, to the, um, the decision makers, to uh, Ministry of Health and Environment also, to include the health uh, uh, experts in designing all of these policies and, and, and the laws, which is not the case. Um, I guess the last year, the, the Republic of Serbia has um, finished or completed the development of the National, Pro Na um, National Air Protection Program, which is the first one in the region. And we spent about like two and a half years advocating uh, among the members of the group, but basically with those consultants developing the, the document to include health into this document, because th there was now huge discussion about that. And um, it was among 40 members of the working group, there was only one representative of the Ministry of Health who has not been invited to provide the knowledge. So what we understand by, by you know, looking at the, um, throughout the years is that uh, the, the ministries, like for example, the Ministry of Energy, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Health do not cooperate between, between themselves, which means also that the countries do not cooperate between countries, you know. And that's a really huge problem because we want to see like decision be led by science, not like, you know, people just having discussion about that because there is a huge, you know, amount of scientific evidence, you know, speaking about how the energy or air pollution affecting like um, the environment, the human health, the future, sustainability and all other stuff. So um, it is really important for decision makers to understand that, you know, uh, bringing the, the, the science to decision making process will like really give the huge benefit for the future of the countries. It's not a, about us, you know, just saying you should do this and that. It's, it's about like, you know, huge amount of people sitting out there and doing the, you know, amazing job um, on, you know, how to improve the, the energy transition, how to, to switch from coal to, to renewables and how to really get into the sustainable way, way of living, like healthy future, like, you know, all of this um, important aspects of, of our communities. And also um, we need to speak about the vulnerability of our communities. It's not like, you know, just mentioning or labeling them and saying you're vulnerable because of this and that. It's, it's a multi-layer um, thing. And uh, I think that it's also that the, the we need to bring more more other players into the into this room. Um, I see that you know we usually have like people from the energy environment and health, but and you know it's it, it's more beyond that. So um, yeah, and um, of course like endings uh, coal subsidies is a huge um, thing here. Um, I think that um, countries. I mean, we heard that the countries are reducing the the. the the subsidies for coal, but, but we, we as an organization still think it's a huge problem and uh, they need to really speed up and to take more ambition actions regarding the coal phase out. And, um, and as an organization, uh, I guess many, some of you maybe know that we also started discussing about the gas and we are saying like it's a fossil gas. So people, you know, also have, yeah, but, but the thing is that many people do not see that as, you know, still fossil fuel and as a threat to the future so again i mean we are going to invest in also in the fossil fuels as a tr transition you know and then again put a lot of money instead of you know thinking at this moment how we can actually move uh, forward and, and to uh, turn to um, renewable energy so yeah i'm just hoping that yeah and thank you for having me and uh, Hila also to, to have a chance to just bring this health angle to, to all the this discussion uh, regarding the Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergeon. And I'm just a bit worried because if in two years of pandemic, we haven't really learned to put health first, I really don't know when we will learn. What you're mentioning is definitely very relevant to put, you know, science and health in the decision making table as a priority, which is very much linked. And I think it's also very much linked with climate change many other important issues that uh, are to be discussed. That's, that's a problem. But also what you mentioned at the very beginning about the cost, I think that will be also very important to internalize the cost of health. Very often it's neglected. If we just put a number and then we realize how much we are spending for that, how much we have spent in government spent in the past two years, 
just trying to, to face an emergency like COVID. Thank you so much. Um, the next speaker that's here next to me, Sana Vasilieva. Anna is working in BRD and you're very, very active on the Just Transition Diagnostic, as also Rachel was mentioning before in her initial presentation. Uh, maybe you can tell us something more about your work in the region. You're very uh, focused on a lot of our contracting parties and also, of course, this is entailing uh, stakeholder engagement as well. Uh, please tell us something more, Anna. Anna. Thank you very much, Irina, and uh, thank you, everyone. In particular, Joanna as well, for putting some trust in us and saying that she hopes that IFIs have come a long way from the transition in the 1990s <laughs> and 2000s. We hope that we learned our lessons as well, and we are uh, starting to become better on a lot of fronts as well. Um, so at the ABRD, we work, obviously, towards achieving the just transition, and I think the definition of leaving no one behind has been raised quite a lot in the previous panels. But I would also like to say that for us, Practically, we think that we are trying to achieve the accelerated decarbonization, which while ensuring the societal buy-in, and we think that that societal buy-in is first and foremost ensured through providing new economic opportunities to the affected regions and communities. So we work towards this ambition into five different dimensions. One of them is supporting the governments in terms of integrating just transition considerations into the um, climate plans, NDCs, NECPs are the key strategic documents in line with the imperatives of the Paris Agreement. The second thing is supporting countries in developing just transition diagnostics and action plans, which I will dive in a little bit uh, later. Um, third, um, I mean, we are a development bank, so uh, our bread and butter is financing mm -hmm. projects that support just transition. Um, and we see those as the ones that work across three different dimensions. And those are green economy transition, reskilling uh, and re-employing workers. Um, and third one is regional economic diversification. So providing new economic opportunities to those communities. Um, and one example, um, just to give you a bit of a flavor is in North Macedonia, we have been working with ESM in order to finance uh, a solar PV park uh, on top of the former site of the coal mine. So that is just one of the examples of the things that we tend to do. Um, we also work to mobilize finance, both from the international community, uh, but also from the private sector to finance these projects. And I think the topic of finance has been raised here quite a lot. Mm -hmm. I think to come back to what Joanna was saying, one of the important things that we, I think, see that is lacking uh, right now in the region, both in Western Balkans, but also in Ukraine, is the availability of grants, particularly for environmental remediation and other things that are not commercially profitable. Because I think when it comes to the private financing and through the international financing, there is quite a lot of that available, be that through World Bank, through us, through EAB, through other financing partners, but particularly the grant element, which could be blended into the transactions, I think is something that um, we all, in particular, the contracting parties could really benefit from. Uh, and obviously we also cooperate with international stakeholders and ensure the knowledge sharing, uh, including through the uh, platform and through the initiative. So when developing our Just Transition initiative, we have undertaken a very extensive review together with Stockholm Environment Institute of the past cases of transition. And that's why I hope that we have learned our lessons. <laughs> um, one of the key findings, um, and you're welcome to read, by the way, the full lessons learned on our website. But one of the key findings is that ensuring the early planning, but also the engagement of local communities, and in particular, also assigning the very clear responsibilities across all levels of administration and stakeholders from national government government to municipal government to the asset owners is really crucial in ensuring the smooth transition. So we try to lay that as a foundation of our approach. This comes particularly handy when we talk about the just transition diagnostics and action plans, which we are supporting currently uh, in North Macedonia together with the European Union delegation, but also in Serbia, um, as well as in Ukraine. Unfortunately, the last one has had to be put on hold because of the Russian invasion of the affected regions. Um, to explain you a little bit what our GT diagnostic and action plan product is, um, we go to identify the affected regions, communities, workers uh, who are impacted by the accelerated decarbonization. And then we try to understand what are the exact impacts, uh, be that on the economic state, be that on health, be that on any other important variables. 
And then we work to identify the opportunities for these people and for these communities, uh, including through the regional economic diversification, which we see as key. Um, and we help the countries and relevant stakeholders to develop the action plans. So these action plans, they really include both the governance arrangements, uh, but also policy reforms, investments for each particular region, um, but also looking to potential funding instruments and mechanisms and clearly identifying what could be accessible to also implement these investments. Um, now, from the very first days of this assignments, we think that stakeholder engagement is really absolutely critical. Uh, so what we do is we develop stakeholder engagement plans to identify the key parties to be involved, but also the modes of their involvement um, and uh, communication channels, which would be most appropriate, including obviously the civil society organizations. So in cooperations with the authorities, we also establish the project working groups and they tend to be quite extensive. So we are talking about 30 plus different stakeholders on board and we work together to get their inputs, get the data from them, but also these people are critical in terms of reviewing the outputs and adopting the final action plans. And we hope that through involvement of relevant ministries, local stakeholders, labor unions, civil society organizations, organizations in this process, we also raise a bit the awareness, which Rachel has been also presenting in the beginning, and we hope to get them a little bit more involved in terms of also ensuring the implementation of this action plan so that it doesn't end up being, you know, yet another piece of paper on the shelf. Um, one of the other critical parts of our approach is the fact-finding mission. So we tend to go on the ground, just like Rachel has been talking about her trip to Bosnia and Herzegovina. Two weeks ago, I uh, spent a week in Serbia, both meeting with the government officials, but also traveling to the coal mining regions as part of our fact-finding mission. And I must say that um, these discussions are really often very revelational. You see that even within one country, you could have very big disparities between the communities, very big differences in the attitudes. So I think that this engagement, particularly with the local authorities, is critical in terms of understanding not only the you know, key bits of information, potential investment plans in the region, but also the attitudes and really the fears of the communities on the ground to understand how to address them and how to bring something to the people in this region so that they too can benefit from the green economy transition. I must also say here that what we were discussing about just transition to me, you know, it's not surprising that first eight, and that mm. 80 plus percent of people in this regions are not aware of the concept of just transition. Um, from my experience, and it's a bit anecdotal, but what I found is that a lot of people are also unaware of the concept of green transition mm. on overall of green skills, green investments and things like that. So we also need to do quite a lot of awareness raising on that side and explain what does it actually bring to them? Because I think here, you know, we are all the believers, right? So we mm. tend to think that, okay, green is excellent, right? But uh, I think it's important to explain what it also means. Uh, both from the perspective of bringing opportunities to people, but also from the perspective of energy security, from diversified energy resources and other key elements like that. So uh, to conclude, we only started our initiative in 2020, but as you can see, we already have quite a lot of work going on, both on the projects and investment sites, and we stand ready to support uh, the countries and clients uh, in terms of achieving these objectives. Because our initiative is so new, it's really still hard to judge, you know, the results and whether our <laughs> approach is working. But I hope that, you know, through what I described to you in terms of stakeholder engagement, approach to developing diagnostics and action plans, that that really helps to ensure the stakeholder participation and not only, you know, get the inputs into this assignment, but also make them feel like they're a part of this process and get that sense of ownership, which I already saw from quite a few uh, participants today, be that from the municipality of Vitala, be that from the municipality of uh, Plevila, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce, uh, and from many others. And I think that is really excellent to see local authorities in particular represented here and talking about these issues and really taking forward the interests of their communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. And I think it's clear it's a call for all organization, local communities, civil society to really be engaged in the process to not only provide feedback, but participate actively. And I think it's good that the ABRD is discussing about this. And, um, yeah, and you have this working group that are also multi-faceted, multi as I understand, civil society is part of that as well. 
So that's also very good and a lot of activities. So it was, was good to hear about the solar project uh, in North Macedonia. And I think it's one of many other, we hope. And what you said about the 80% is definitely something that's, yeah, we probably could assume. Uh, but what uh, is a bit more interesting to see what the 69% of people that don't even know what the government is doing when it comes to green transition, renewables, efforts, etc. So definitely there is a lot of work for all of us. Thank you. And with that, I will go with my to my next speaker that is joining us online. Let's see if we can see Shipe. Yes. So Shipe, you're here now to bring also the perspective of women and the just transition. The way too often is considered as something only for male workers. But I think we heard from Rachel also at the beginning that that's not the case that we have to consider the whole household. Um, my question to you is the following. A poorly planned mind closure are likely to have a significant impact on women and girls. Um, how can we ensure that that is not the case when it comes to just transition and that um, the just transition is really equitable across genders and not only focus on one gender? Thank you. Thank you very much, Irina. Uh, you can hear me, right? You can hear me, okay, great. Um, thank you once again for having me to join this very important discussion. I've been following closely uh, my um, other panel members um, and uh, I think some of the issues, uh, very important issues were already raised uh, with Rachel, uh, Rachel on inclusive stakeholder engagement, uh, the importance that Ioana mentioned on the access to finance, which I also plan to touch a little bit uh, during my part. So John, the health impacts, which uh, we can neglect. And then, the, uh, and then with Anna on inclusion of various uh, groups to make sure uh, that the processes are inclusive, but also just. Um, before, before I dive into like how it can actually uh, affect women and girls, uh, maybe maybe just a little bit of, of, of background on uh, Kosovo's energy sector, which I'm pretty sure most of the uh, members coming from the contracting parties of the Energy Community Secretary are already aware. Um, uh, we're, we're still dealing with the electricity crisis and, and before we even move into like talking about the requirement of a huge transformation of all across sectors, ensuring a just transition towards a sustainable, low carbon and equitable energy system, uh, we have to also take into account what's happening uh, in, in various countries. I don't think there's one size fits all. Uh, definitely in Kosovo's case, I believe that there should be like a particular or let's say a unique uh, model of, uh, of, the, of the just transition. Uh, we in particular need to undergo a major transition from the use of fossil fuels to adoption of more renewables. Um, we still expect to see the sector go through the market liberalization and a further diversification of the energy mix. However, we still rely heavily on coal with over 90% produced by two power plants which were built uh, in the 60s and 80s. According to the report published by the Energy Community Secretariat last year, uh, Kosovo has the highest uh, energy poverty rate among the contracting parties. So basically it's 40%. And last but not least, uh, what will have an impact is also the carbon pricing, which is already mentioned. Uh, implementation of which would entail significant socioeconomic challenges for Kosovo, uh, or increase in electricity costs, burdening for households, which as I said, they're already energy poor. Um, and uh, this is why I believe that our pathway uh, not only will be complex, but will also be uh, unique. Uh, to succeed, um, the energy transition must be just. It must be done in a way that delivers sustainable energy access for all, leaving no one behind. And it must be done with women. Uh, however, when, you, when we talk about the sector, we're still facing uh, difficulties as, um, as were mentioned by, by the previous speakers that there's a lack of uh, gender representation. Um, according to the IEA, we have about 22% of the labor force in oil and gas, and then 32% in renewables. However, in our country, uh, we have less than 10%. So it's roughly 9% overall. Um, we don't have data exactly how many women are in mining. However, when uh, we look at the decision-making bodies, it's less than 1%. So, um, we do have mining engineers. However, we, do, we don't have women in mines. 
um, 100 percent of coal miners are actually men. Uh, even when the industries with mines would advertise for new positions, they would specifically say men only. Uh, so it, it goes back to the discussion that we said in the very beginning, like there needs to be education, there needs to be awareness raising, uh, that this uh, is not a male dominant, this is not the male, male only uh, sector. And uh, not to mention like these two power plants, the famous two are, are two famous coal power plants, they were designed to accommodate only men. So any engineers that have to work during the day, uh, they really face difficulties in, in a sense that there are, for example, no toilets for women. So what can be done to ensure that the trans transition is just? I'd say uh, focusing on three pillars. Um, the very first one would be a balanced workforce, um, a workforce training, targeted workplace, uh, gender interventions to lead to a more skilled workers in the labor force, uh, increasing diversity as well. Uh, we are currently finalizing our energy strategy, 10-year energy strategy, 2022-2031, and our target for the moment to increase the women participation in the energy sector is from 9 to 25 excuse me to 25 percent um uh, the other the other uh, intervention should be removing barriers and st structural uh, inequality as i said we do have laws that prevent discrimination in hiring in the workplace however a uh, women and in particular women from minority communities uh, including Roma, Ashkali, and Egyptian minorities face even greater challenges to employment. Um, three, uh, the third part would be how to enable strategies for inclusion. Uh, it was al already mentioned that there are uh, various uh, like mechanisms that we can use, policy documents, NECPs. In our case, it's also the energy strategy. Um, uh, currently, uh, there were uh, consultations just completed uh, with the uh, civil society, media, uh, citizens across Kosovo's municipalities from the Ministry of Economy that is in charge of the energy strategy to make sure that everyone is informed of what's happening, what needs, uh, what decisions need to be to be taken, and how is the energy structure uh, sector going to change, uh, taking into account that we're facing uh, electricity crisis, taking into account that we're, we're still relying on coal, that we're moving towards renewables, and making sure that we're leaving uh, no one behind. And last but not least, uh, there are uh, very powerful networks uh, like Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition, International Women in Mining, uh, that you that are as platforms of women professionals uh, sharing information, experiences uh, from across the world, and empowering other women uh, uh, to, to to join the industry. And last but not least, uh, more uh, involvement on uh, inclusion and behavioral trainings and awareness campaigns and also uh, working groups uh, that were already already uh, mentioned by uh, Anna. So I'd leave it at this. If there are more questions, I can also uh, provide more information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shifa. I think it was, it was very clear the point you made, the importance of training for, for the sector, for just transition as such as well, to, to really be diverse, to, to walk the talk, to be uh, inclusive for real. Uh, for Kosovo, at least the uh, importance of increasing the number of women substantially. You, you were conservative, actually, for 25. You didn't aim to 50%. And the minority, you are right, women, women in minority, they suffer much more than, uh, than us, probably. Public consultation, we are aware that you are uh, really pushing for that. And I think all of us present here, we had the chance to have a look at the energy strategy. Uh, and as you said, the platform like yours are also highly beneficial. So many thanks for all the good efforts in this sense. And with that, I will go with our last speaker. I'm not that I'm eroding more time, but I think I cannot stop my speaker only with five minutes. So I see okay for my colleagues. So it's okay. Last speaker is Goran Kerstovich from GIZ. Many thanks, Goran. Sorry for being the last, but a very important speaker because you're from GIZ. And you know, you know, we all know how much GIZ is supporting contracting parties proactively and practically in the region. Um, yeah, my question for you really will be, how can we raise this awareness about just transition that we see these 80% and 69% alarming figures? What uh, donors and stakeholders like GIZ can do more <laughs> than what you're already doing to increase this awareness uh, in the Western Balkans, but also beyond? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Irina. Uh, I will use the advantage of the home status here in Sarajevo, so I will speak in, in Bosnian. So, um, interessantno je uh, vrlo kompleksan jedan proces kompletna tranzicija, a i 
proces pravedne tranzicije koji je prateći mehanizam za implementaciju cjelokupne tranzicije i s tim u vezi potrebno ga je vrlo kompleksno sagledati i pristupiti sa više strana. Mislim da je danas uglavnom sve dosta toga rečeno, da se ne bih se ponavljao, fokusirao bi se upravo na ovo vaše pitanje, odnosno šta tehničke asistencije mogu ponuditi u samom procesu pravedne tranzicije i jačanju svijesti o benefitima koje pravedna tranzicija sama po sebi donosi. Šta je prednost tehničkih asistencija? Govorimo o donorskim međunarodnim organizacijama koje su pozicionirane u zemljama sa svojim ofisima na terenu i šta je prednost njihova u odnosu recimo na međunarodne finansijske institucije koje radi po principu misija, malo su više udaljene od samog mjesta dešavanja, što sve upućuje na jednu potrebu za jednom jakom sinergijom svih aktera sa strane međunarodne zajednice koje se bave ovom problematikom. Znači, te tehničke asistencije imaju tu mogućnost da su poprilično čvrsto uvezane sa širokim spektrum stakeholdera na terenu, kao i u ovoj oblasti, i mogu da plasiraju aktivnosti tehničke asistencije ciljano na, čak i na one najmanje grupe, stakeholdera koji se identifikuju sa visokim stepenom potrebe za jačanjem svijesti, za jačanjem kapaciteta za bilo čim. I u tom smislu naglašavam potrebu, upravo tu potrebu. Opet, s druge strane, tehničke asistencije nemaju funding, nemaju velike izvore finansiranja koje mogu da osiguraju a opet u saradnji sa međunarodnim finansijskim institucijama vrlo značajni napredak se tu može postaviti. Šta bih još izdvojio? Evo jedan primjer koji GIZ implementira na regionalnom nivou putem otvorenog regionalnog fonda za energiju i transport. Projekat je finansiran od strane EU for Energy and Transport Transition Western Balkan in Turkey. Upravo jedan dio tog regionalni projekat i upravo jedan dio projekta, jedna komponenta je posvjeđena upravo multi-governance pristupu u implementaciji zelene agende. Znači, imamo krovni nivo na nacionalnom nivou koji se reflektuje kroz NECP proces koji utvrđuje mehanizme energetske tranzicije, a opet imamo kroz vrlo zastupljen mehanizam kroz Covenant of Mayors SKP koje definišu sve te stvari na lokalnom nivou. Ono što je primjetno do sad bilo, da je to poprilično rađeno odvojeno jedno od drugih, koristeći neke različite metodologije i onda ne možete uopšte poraditi ono što je u ta dva pristupa napravljeno. I upravo ovo što GIZ na Zapadnom Balkanu i Turskoj provodi aktivnost i upravo dati je fokus na taj multi-government i saradnju tih nivoa, spojiti NECP i SKP, uspostaviti istu metodologiju, iste mehanizme praćenja, monitoringa, stakeholdere uvezati na taj način da s jedne strane imamo lokalnu zajednicu koja priča sa institucionalnim nivom. I mišljenja smo da se na taj način mnogo toga može učiniti po pitanju, naravno, pravedne taranzicije, posebno u lokalnim zajednicama, regionima, bogatim ugljem, 
gdje se ove stvari trebaju, trebaju izdefinisati. Tako da bi to bio jedan isto prijedlog a, a, da se da a, fokus na, na taj način a, komunikacije. I još jedna samo ovaj, a, a, preporuka. A, sama struktura NECP-a a, prema regulativi governance regulation definiše u jednom svom poglavlju potrebu za utvrđivanjem procjene utjecaja, politika i mjera koje su predviđene samom, samim NCP dokumentom i to se treba elaborirati u samom dokumentu. Znači, fokus je dat na procjenu utjecaja ekonomsku, to je obligatorno da se radi. Međutim, procjene utjecaja društvena i okolišna su ostavljene zemljama na odabir da li da to moraju, a i ne moraju da, da, da uradi. Međutim, posmatrajući sad i shvatajući bitnost pravedne tranzicije, upravo je to mjesto gdje država treba da definiše mehanizme. S jedne strane, država treba da, da, da mehanizme za, za pravednu tranziciju, a s druge strane su lokalne zajednice koje te mehanizme trebaju da, 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 da absorbiraju. Možda da se malo, evo, preporuka i, i, i vama u sekretarijatu, da se da malo veća pozornost na social impact assessment u okviru NCP dokumenta, gdje bi se upravo ove stvari, ovaj, jer nedostaje pravedna tranzicija u planskom dijelu. Pravedna just transition nekako uh, lepdi iznad čitavog ovog procesa. Potrebno je dati malo, malo jače, jače osnove, uključiti u, u strategiju, u planski dio i onda na taj način mislim da bi bila jača uh, uporište za implementaciju svih ovih aktivnosti. Eto, toliko. Thank you. Thank you very much, Goran. I think it was very useful, your recommendation, and actually, you, you are right, it should be really inside the NECPs, and your suggestion of the impact assessment and try to include that there, I think it's, it's very relevant. And also the work that GSZ is doing on linking, I know the CCAP, so you're linking the local Uh, energy plans and the coming out of mayors, what they're doing at local level with the NECP, I think it's really, really relevant and it's definitely uh, what is needed to, to translate then these plans in, at local level and in, uh, in concrete terms. So point taken, point taken. Thank you so much. I think with this, um, we are concluding. Uh, before closing, I would like to just open very briefly the floor, five minutes, if we have any questions from the audience. There is one question there. Yes, uh, we have a short time for a question. I have one question. What is your uh, experience um, about public perception of uh, just transition process? Something that uh, that uh, this gentleman sp uh, speak about because uh, in our city, when we uh, when we speak about just transition process. Everybody thinks there is a process uh, and they're scared about the process that the, they mean that people mean that they is a process, then will they will lose jobs. Uh, it, it's bad perception for just transition process. What is your experience? What should be done for a uh, public meaning just to change it? Maybe we should uh, include more media like local governments or I don't know. What is your experience and uh, what is your suggestions thank so since, you thank you so much and maybe to introduce yourself you're emilia and yeah. she's yes emilia uh, from the municipality of bitola perfect yes. so we don't have much time but maybe you can say two things really each of you you can just pinpoint on two things and also the colleagues online if you're still online with us uh so we go around the table and then to the colleagues online so two elements on what you will raise to uh, underline to raise the awareness in the region challenging but Yeah. <laughs> Difficult question. Uh, I think our experience is the same. I mean, um, if we talk to municipalities, I think often we find that uh, people fear transition. And that is because I think there is often a lack of planning. And what we find is that if countries have set 
the concrete call phase out date and have undertaken certain commitments, there's at least a little bit of certainty because then you can prepare associated action plans and ensure a very early transition. So in the case of North Macedonia, you know, we are talking about 2027 approximately, right, in terms of NDC commitment. And that allows to have a few years in order to prepare for the planning and to come with investments. And for us, it's very important to have that time and to have those opportunities in order to support municipalities like yours. I think it's also important to convey to the people that just transition inherently is a positive thing. Um, and I feel like here it comes down to the distinguishing of two very related processes. One of them is energy transition, which could be taken as a given, right? This is something that is developed by countries set at the national levels, but just transition is a way to ensure that this transition is just and provides new opportunities. So I feel like that is one of the elements that could be used in the communication. Sorry, more Thank than two you. words. <laughs> Joanna. My experience in Romania, which has undergone a, yeah, let's face it, a failed transition in the early 2000s in one of the um, coal regions. Uh, my experience is that it, it's kind of a two-way road. Um, what, what we noticed when we first started going to the regions and we asked, like we were meeting with, with community representatives, people that we thought were, we considered community leaders and with the mayor and so on. So we were kind of gauging their ideas. What would, what, what, what would your future look like? And people really, um, we found that, that they didn't have, they lacked this exercise of imagination because it's so common that the decisions are made um, in centrally, right? In the government and, and the local communities are not consulted. So I think this was the main lesson for me to kind of empower people in the, in, in the on the local level to to dream about what their future wants to be and of course this this rests in the skill of and and, and kind of talent of the of the mayors in the in the end and it's in our interaction with the mayor but equally because i said two-way road um it was very important for for local municipalities or for regions to know that the eu takes an interest in this and this is yeah like um a message to European institutions present um, in this meeting that it's really important to to go to the region and to see on the ground what the challenges are and, and listen to the people. This really sped things yeah sped things up in in our case. Well, coming from the health sector, I would say that we have experienced a lot of you know uh, those kind of fear situations because people have um, been af uh, afraid of um, diseases. So one, one of the things that I would like highlight here is again about the campaigning and also the providing the knowledge to the people so they can better understand what's all about. That's the thing that I see, it's, it's uh, something that is missing because the knowledge is you know, our personal asset. So it's giving us the opportunity to change the way how we live and also when it comes to the decision makers is the way of how they make the decision. So it's a behavior change like, like as a whole. So it's not only about, so what I've seen also is that we have a lot of NGOs running the com campaigns at the same time. So people maybe might be confused by all, getting all of different uh, information at the same time. For me, at least, it's very hard to follow, even I'm part of this community. Um, so I think that the, the, the responsibility of countries also to provide this through, I guess, campaigns, which could be like very effective um, to the communities, just to give them the knowledge where we are all going together, because it's about us. It's not about them and us. It's like, you know, the, the community as a whole. So sharing the knowledge could be a way of getting us there. <laughs> Da, uh, postoji način, naravno, ovaj, uh, kako po, po, podizati javnu svijest. Uh, po mene je najbolji način uh, demonstracijom nekih dobrih praksi. Evo, konkretno, bit ću kratak, samo ovaj, u ovom slučaju uh, postoje nekoliko modela koje se mogu primijeniti na lokalnim zajednicama upravo za prelazak za implementaciju pravedne tranzicije. Prvi primjer je, svi smo mi, evo, tokom izrade ovih NECP-a, strategija ciljeva, veći dio toga se odnosi na strategiju obnove zgrada. 
izrazito skup, skup aktivnosti. Ogromna količina novca je potrebna, ali na stranu to, novac možda će se i pronaći. Problem je u tome što nema radne snage koja može to da iznese. Recimo u Bosni i Hercegovini imate problem u građevinskom sektoru, nema radnika. Znači, bez obzira u svim tim kilotonama iz stambenog sektora koje prebacimo na onu čeliju radnika, izlazi da je taj cilj za Bosnu i Hercegovinu neostvariv ne zbog novca, nego zbog toga što nema radne snage. Opet s druge strane, radnici u rudarskom sektoru ostaju bez posla procesom tranzicije, postepeno naravno. Postoji mogućnost da se razmotri taj jedan dio da se putem nekim demonstracijskih projekata napravi vidljivi primjer i da to funkcioniše i da se taj aspekt pravedne tranzicije primjeni upravo na tim čelijama. Drugi primjer je razvoj obnovljivih izvora energije, zasnovan na community-based modelima, gdje također se može u kontekstu pravedne tranzicije ponuditi lokalnom stanovništvu modeli gdje oni imaju benefite od učešća u tim stvarima. Zajedno sa elektroprirodnim društvima, sa površinama rudnika koje treba rekultivisati, izgradnjom obnovljivih izvora energije, uključivanjem community-based modela, mogu se ostvariti benefiti i na konkretnim primjerima raditi na podizanju javne svijesti. Na dva primjera samo i u tom smislu bi se moglo krenuti. Thank you very much, Goran. And we go now online. I see Rachel is still connected. Rachel, could you say a couple of words, you as well, and then ship it? Rachel? Sure, I could go first. Um, I, if I understood the question correct, I think the key thing is about um, realism, that these are not easy processes and, you know, it will not be a one-for-one -one transition. I think there's been a lot of overselling of the simplicity of how the transition is, is going to occur. And I think the first message is one of realism and that, that it's going to be hard. Um, that said, I think the United States, for me, um, the communities in the Appalachia region provide the most inspiration for what community mobilization and work from the ground up really means. And it, it hinges really on, on five, I think, key things, and I'll just say them very quickly. The first is a message of not don't wait, don't wait for a national or federal level government to come in to solve the problems. Start to do things yourselves to the degree that you can in your own communities. Second is that it's a lot of hard work and, and the requirement to be committed over time. The third is that everyone has a role to play. Um, there is not a single institution and actor in a coal community that does not have a significant um, amount of experience and energy to bear on the problem. The fourth is that vision is going to be key. And so early sort of processing and strategizing, no matter where you think your country is at, is critical. And the fifth, to start small. Try things out, see how, how you can bring along um, reluctant and enthusiastic actors through small projects and then look for the scalability after that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this was really, really interesting point, especially I, I know that done the realism, which is key, the community, of course, and also Star Small this is also the key. Thank you so much, Rachel. And we go now to Shipe. Shipe, you're closing the, the panel, so <laughs> over to you. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> Actually, to me, um, I think one of the most important parts would be uh, to use the data uh, from the survey that the World Bank has done and see how these countries can use this information and then like turn it into like policy, turn it into awareness campaigns and take it to a further level because I think uh, at least for Kosovo, we don't have such a 
information for the time being. So this would be quite useful uh, for the decision makers. So two points. The very first one, uh, very worrying, 80% not being aware. I think we see like a disconnect between uh, decision makers and then uh, communities or citizens. Uh, what means what I've seen is like sometimes we use jargon, like if you're in the energy sector and you understand certain ter terminology, that does not necessarily mean that all the people out there will understand it. So you need to, to use a simple language, no jargon and make sure translation is appropriate and uh, not just verbatim. Uh, the other is uh, make sure you visit areas like just doing awareness campaigns via TV stations. Sometimes they don't work like maybe uh, people don't have time to watch TV. Maybe they don't have access to social media. So it's good to visit the coal, uh, coal areas, especially how these communities will be affected and tell, tell them what the process will be like. Um, and then the second part, which is the very positive one, 73% uh, said that they are interested in to be involved. I think that's a very positive uh, response of citizens showing that they're interested in to participate, they're interested in to learn more what it will require, and that uh, decision makers must ensure that uh, decisions, policies that are made are transparent, inclusive, and they take into account uh, all the communities and uh, different stakeholders involved uh, opinions. So that's it for my part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shipa. Thank you. You ended up brilliantly. The disconnection is real. And sometimes we do that. We don't even understand that that's happening. So that, that's true. There is a disconnection between local communities and the policymakers. And we have to fill this gap. Uh, visiting the areas, I think we hear about that from a lot of speakers, that once you visit, you have a completely different uh, perception by discussing with the locals, of course, and this is important, and then transparency and inclusion. Thank you so much to you online, Shipe, Rachel, to all of you, Goran, Serjan, Joanna, Anna, for joining us for this panel. It took a bit longer, but I think it was worth it. And thank you for the audience to joining us today at the Just Transition Forum. Thank you so much. Before we let you leave this room, <laughs> Just a few um, announcements. The first one is that we would really like to thank you for staying till the end online and physically. Thank you for your active participation, for your willingness to share with us your ideas, to debate and to engage actively in the discussion.